In case you didn't know this already, religions are complex, and the deeper you dive, the more you realize what you have yet to learn. Even in a tradition like Sufism, which in itself is a part of the larger religion of Islam, we quickly realize that it is consists of a huge inner diversity and complexity. Not all Sufis practice in the same way, and they don't believe in the same things. In fact, Sufism is very famously divided up into different uh, mystical orders, in Arabic known as turuq, in plural, or tariqa, path, in singular. Now, not all Sufis adhere to a specific Sufi order, and the order structure was not the standard during the first few centuries of, of its development, but from the 12th century or so, the, 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 the way of structuring the Sufi, or Sufism into these different mystical orders became the norm, and immensely popular, and remains so until today. In this video, which is a collaboration with the excellent historical channel Al Muqaddimah, we will be exploring one of the most famous and widespread of these orders. Al Muqaddimah's video on the history of Islamic presence in the region of Xinjiang in China gives us some of the historical context, but in this companion video, we will be in particular diving into the tariqa called Naqshbandiya. The Naqshbandiya, or Naqshbandi order, is an old one, dating back to the late Middle Ages. It is widespread across the world today, and has often been considered one of the more orthodox Sufi orders, as we will see why soon. But if you've watched any of my previous videos, you should know by now that any discussions about things like orthodoxy is often pretty useless. The origins of this tariqa is usually considered to be the Central Asian Sufi saint and master Baha'uddin Muhammad al Naqshband, who is also the namesake of the order itself. Being from modern-day Uzbekistan and living in the 14th century, the order that was founded around his teaching would become immensely popular in the following centuries, especially in the eastern parts of the Muslim world, places like Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent. While Baha'uddin Naqshband is the main figure and founder of the order, it is said that it wasn't consolidated into a distinct tariqa until under the influence of a later follower called Ubaidullah Ahrar, who was a second generation disciple of Naqshband himself. And he was very important in the establishment of the Naqshbandiya as a proper order, a tariqa. The Naqshbandiya is quite unique in terms of its chain of authority, of spiritual authority. You see, all Sufi orders and really all Sufi masters trace their spiritual authority in a chain called a silsila that always eventually go back to the Prophet Muhammad himself. So if you take basically any Sufi sheikh today, like for example the current leader of the Naqshbandi Khalidi Haqqani branch, by the name Sheikh Muhammad Adil Arabani, he received his ijaza, which is his authority to teach and spiritual instruction, by his master Nazim al Haqqani, who received his spiritual transmission or spiritual authority from his master, Sheikh Abdullah al Daghestani, and so on in a chain of masters that eventually reached the Prophet Muhammad himself. Now, all Sufi orders and all Sufi masters have a chain like this, simply the only difference being that they have different variations on this chain with different masters in different places and so on, but every Sufi order has a silsila, a chain of, of spiritual authority and transmission. The uniqueness of the Naqshbandiya is firstly that they have two main stems or chains, one of which goes through uh, Ali, the Prophet's son-in-law and cousin, and this is probably one of the most widespread or common ways for these chains to work. And in this way, Ali is very important for most of the Sufi orders as being one of the main persons 
um, that traces this chain back to the Prophet Muhammad. But the Naqshbandiya have another chain that goes through the first caliph Abu Bakr before reaching the Prophet Muhammad, and this chain is often referred to as the golden chain, and it's the one that most Naqshbandi masters emphasize the most. But in any case, the Naqshbandiya, in all of its inner diversity and just like all other Sufi orders, has certain characteristic practices and teachings that distinguish it from other orders. Now, it would be a mistake to think that these different Sufi orders, or Sufism in general, has a distinct theology of its own in a distinct way. For the most part, Sufis in history and in these different Sufi orders have followed one of the established schools of Kalam or theology, like the Asharis or the Maturidis, for example, even if they were often also hostile to speculative theology in general. Instead, what distinguishes these different Sufi orders from each other and from non-Sufis is primarily their practices. Now, as I said, the, the word for these orders in Arabic is tariqa, which literally means a path. So they could be seen as different paths, different uh, methods and techniques to reach intimacy with God, also sometimes called union with God. And perhaps the most characteristic and distinguishing feature of the Naqshbandi path is their practice of silent dhikr. Now, dhikr is probably the main practice in all of Sufism. It literally translates to remembrance and is a practice in which God is invoked through recalling his different names or through phrases like la ilaha illallah, there is no god but God. Uh, this is in fact a practice that basically all Sufi orders and Sufis generally take part in in some way, but it can take on many different forms. It is usually chanted rhythmically in a group, and on occasion even different instruments like frame drums can be used. But the Naqshbandiya is unique in the sense that their practice of the dhikr is entirely silent. That is, it is not chanted out loud, but only in the heart or mind of the practitioner. The justification for this is usually that it will prevent the person from being, quote, preoccupied with the movement of the tongue, instead of being engrossed in directing the heart towards union with God. On top of this, the Naqshbandi has also generally rejected the use of music as any kind of spiritual practice. There are, of course, many other different aspects that are unique to the Naqshbandiya that we could discuss, but we don't really have time to go through all of it in this video. There is, for example, the so-called 11 Naqshbandi principles, supposedly authored by the founders of the order, and I'll leave them on the screen so that you can pause and read it through if you want. But as of right now, I will only be exploring one of these principles principles, which is also, I think, a very characteristic aspect of the Naqshbandi order, and this is the idea of solitude in the crowd. This idea can briefly be summarized as an attitude where the mystic is to be internally detached from the world, and only preoccupied with God, while outwardly he or she still participate actively in society. In other words, the Naqshbandi Sufis have generally rejected the more kind of extreme forms of renunciation that we find in many other orders like the Shishtiya or the Khalwatiya, for example. There is no living alone in a cave in the mountains in the Naqshbandi order, generally at least. This has also led to the fact that the Naqshbandis have often taken a very active role in social and political questions. In Central Asia and in India, for example, they were often very close uh, with the emperors or the kings and influence the political uh, scene uh, to a very large degree. Now, the Naqshbandiya is not the only tariq or order that has this kind of active attitude, of course, but it can still be said to be a very characteristic aspect of their path, I, I would say at least. And because of all of the above, the Naqshbandiya is often considered a sober Sufi order, as it doesn't contain many of the other sort of ecstatic practices and teachings that we find elsewhere. This active attitude of the order is also probably one of the reasons that it has been so successful in its wider spread. As I've said previously, they were especially popular in Central Asia, and perhaps most prominently in on the Indian subcontinent. During Mughal times, for example, the Naqshbandiya rose to great prominence and often influenced the politics and the court of the Mughals to a large degree. In the Indian context, as well as elsewhere, the Naqshbandiya has often come to be seen as representing Islamic orthodoxy and as being the orthodox Sufi order. 
Of course, statements like this are incredibly problematic, as terms like orthodoxy are always fluid and subjective, but what it does point to is that the Naqshbandis have often had a more strict and conservative way of applying or relating to the Sharia, the Islamic law, as well as its general Sufi practices. In Mughal India, for example, it often stood in great contrast to the other major orders like the Shishtiya and Qadiriya on a number of grounds. The Naqshbandis, as we have seen, rejected any form of sama or music as a spiritual practice, something that was widespread in both the Shishtiya and Qadiriya. They also performed the silent dhikr as opposed to the more vocal form, which was more prevalent, and the Naqshbandi masters often openly criticized the other orders for not adhering properly to Islamic law as a result. They came to be seen by their supporters as guardians of the Islamic law against the innovations of the heterodox Sufis. Of course, it's important to remember that the supporters of the other orders saw themselves in the exact same way, but when scholars talk about the Naqshbandiya today, this is the common image of a more orthodox Sufi order that adhered strictly to Islamic law. In fact, one of the most prominent and influential figures in the history of the Naqshbandi order appears in this very context in Mughal India in the person of Ahmed Sirhindi. He is seen by many as a mujadid, a reviver of the religion, and wrote a treatise he called Al-Maktubat, where he openly criticizes some of the other Sufis in India and their practices and ideas. He wanted to revive the religion and Sufism by returning it to a strict adherence to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. One of the main aspects of Sufism in India that he criticized was the doctrine called Wahdat al-Wujud, or the unity of being. So here we actually do get into a bit of theology. In general, as I've said, the Sufis follow the established schools of theology, but they are distinguished from non-Sufis in their insistence on the imminence of God in the world and the possibility of reaching intimacy with him uh, in this life. The goal of much of Sufi practice throughout all of Sufism can be said to be the concept known as fana, which means annihilation. This is the annihilation of the individual self into the absolute reality that is God. Um, and this concept has been understood in many different ways throughout history, but generally we are usually not dealing with um, the idea that the individual is actually united or merged with God. This Most Sufis would reject this idea. Instead, we are talking about a realization of the non-existence of the individual self and thus a realization that God is really the only thing that exists in reality. The doctrine of Wahdat al-Wujud, which I have already dedicated several videos to, is usually traced back to the Andalusian Sufi Ibn Arabi and his school. In criminally short terms, it is the idea that God is the only reality, being identified with being or existence itself, in Arabic wujud, which is thus ultimately one, hence the unity of being. Ahmed Sirhindi was very critical of this idea, as he equated it with pantheism and associated it with um, Hindu ideas, so instead he proposed a modification of this doctrine, which he called Wahdat al-Shuhud, which means the, the unity of the witnessing. The distinction here is that the experience of uniting with God is only a subjective experience and does not mean that it is objective truth or objective reality as such, thus trying to maintain the absolute separation between God and creation. But now, as many scholars like William Chittick have pointed out, the whole idea of Wahdat al-Shuhud is really based on a misunderstanding of Ibn Arabi's doctrine, and when we dive deeper, we realize that they are essentially saying the same thing. This is one perspective on it, at least, and I will probably be dedicating a whole other video to this question in particular, so for now, let's return to the main subject of the video. Ahmed Sirhindi's ideas were so influential and, and popular that a whole branch, one of the largest branches of the order, was formed around him, called the Naqshbandi Mujadidi. He and his followers also had a significant influence in the Mughal court. Whereas royals like Akbar, Shah Jahan, Jahangir, and Darashuku had been primarily influenced by the Shishti and Qadri orders, the Emperor Aurangzeb and many of his successors were Naqshbandis, and their rule is often considered to have inaugurated a more strict and unforgiving period in Mughal rule, which reflects the Naqshbandis more kind of strict and conservative approach to, to Sufism and, and Islam generally.
but the order also spread outside of India and Central Asia. It eventually made its way to China, for example, which is a subject that al muqaddimah deals with in his video. It also spread to Anatolia and the Ottoman Empire and the sort of Egypt and, and Damascus, Syria, Iraq, and all. It, it eventually became an incredibly widespread order, which remains until today. It is one of the most widespread Sufi orders in the world at this point. There are major branches of the Naqshbandiya in places like the United States, and Europe, as well as in Asia and the Middle East. The Naqshbandi Haqqani order is especially popular in the West and has a strong presence online. To some degree, the Naqshbandi are still seen as one of the more orthodox Sufi orders because many of their doctrines and characteristics that have been discussed in this video, but there's also a wide span of different branches and groups that can strongly differ from each other, ranging from very traditional orthodox forms to more, some of the more prominent uh, neo-Sufi so-called movements in the world today. The Naqshbandi order is thus a very complex tariqa. It originated in Central Asia in what is today Uzbekistan, but has since spread across most parts of the world. It is characterized by some of its teachings and practices, like the silent dhikr, which makes it stand out and add to the nuance and complexity and diversity of Sufism in particular, of Islam and religion in general. Don't forget to watch al muqaddimahs video on the history of Islamic presence in Xinjiang, China. It connects to some of the discussions in this video. You should also definitely subscribe to his channel. It is one of the best sources for Islamic political history that you can find online and has some absolutely beautiful visuals to go along with it. I highly recommend it. As always, I would like to extend my warmest gratitude towards my patrons, without which this channel would not be possible. Especially, I would like to extend thanks to some of my new patrons, Manuel Fehman and Shamir Tausif. Thank you all so much. I would, of course, highly appreciate if some other viewers would like to become patrons as well. This would help me continue to make these videos. Um, I will leave a link to my Patreon page in the description. You can also, of course, leave a one-time donation to my PayPal account, which I will also link to in the description. If you want more videos like this on different Sufi orders, then please let me know in the comments. This is one of my favorite subjects, as I'm sure some of you already know. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, then of course I would highly appreciate if you would subscribe, and I will see you next time.